Shalom. Today we're continuing in the Gospel according to John. We are investigating the Hebraic background and how the hearers of the Gospel in that time might have received it. We are continuing in chapter 1, verse 15. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake, he that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. We have already talked a bit about the, some scriptures of things that were from the foundation of the world that indicate that there, there were things that were with God in the beginning. In addition, we see Isaiah 41.4. Who hath wrought and done it, calling the generations from the beginning? I, Yahweh the first, and with the last, I am he. Also in Daniel 7.9, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. Amidst the rabbinic commentary, we find this idea. Of the six things which existed before creation, when only the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, two of the things that existed before creation, the Torah and the throne of God were complete in every detail. The remaining four, however, that is, the patriarchs, Israel, the temple, and the name of Messiah existed prior to the creation only in an incomplete form. Regardless of whether this is true, at least it shows that in the thought of the people, there were things that were with God from the beginning. Continuing in verses 16 through 18, And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses. Grace and truth came by Yeshua the Messiah. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. So I hope that you have learned by now that the word but, making a difference between law and grace and truth, is not in the actual text. There is no conjunction there. We do see a framework that Moses presented the problem, he presents the need, and Yeshua presents the solution. If you think there was no grace in the Old Testament, uh, just please go to Genesis 6 and find that Noah found grace in the eyes of God. There has always been grace. If there was no grace, we would not be here. We see from Exodus 34.6, that it is the nature of God that he is gracious and abundant in truth, grace and truth. Continuing in verses 19 through 21, And this is the record of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, What then? Art thou Elias, Elijah? And he saith, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, No. So apparently they asked him if he was three different uh, persons that they might expect to see at some point. They asked about Messiah, they asked about Elijah, and they asked about that prophet. We see in Matthew sixteen fourteen that they had the same questions of Yeshua. They said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist. Some say, Elijah. Others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. So there was an expectation. In Sanhedrin 11a, we read, Our rabbis taught, since the death of the last prophets, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, the Holy Spirit, which would be the prophetic inspiration, has departed from Israel, yet they were still able to avail themselves of the bat kol. The bat kol is supposedly a voice that comes from heaven so that we do not find they expected any prophet until the days of Messiah, nor indeed that any in that interim of time did pretend to that character. They believed that at the coming of the Messiah, the prophets were to rise again. So they're asking John, are you the Messiah? Or you, are you bringing the Messiah? Are you a prophet that shows us that Messiah is here because you've risen from the dead? These are their questions. Again in Sanhedrin 99, all the prophets prophesied only of the days of Messiah. So they had this expectation. Rob, who is one of the sages of old, said, 
All the predestined dates for redemption have passed, and the matter now depends only on repentance and good deeds. That's from Psalm 197a. So as they see John calling for repentance, that sets them in the mindset that Messiah is coming. Concerning the good deeds, it is written, Rabbi Yochanan said in the name of Rabbi Simeon bar Yochai, if Israel were to keep two Sabbaths according to the laws thereof, this would be good deeds that they're looking for, they would be redeemed immediately. For it is said, Thus saith the Lord, the eunuch that keep my Sabbath, which is followed by even them will I bring to my holy mountain, and so forth, which is a quote from Isaiah. So we find that in Tractate Shabbat 118b. And there are still people that believe this. If if the Jews, all every Jew would keep one Shabbat or two Shabbats, then psh, Messiah would show up immediately. Of course, they know about the coming of Elijah from Scripture, Malachi 4.5. In the Jewish numbering system, it's 323. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of Yahweh. When they are talking about that prophet, they are referring to Deuteronomy 18, uh, verses really 15 through 18. Yahweh thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren like unto me. Unto him ye shall hearken. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. They specifically ask after Jeremiah because they know that Jeremiah will bring the new covenant, as it is written in chapter 31, verses 31 through 33. Behold, the days come, saith Yahweh, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in that day, as Moses did, that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke. Although I was a husband to them, saith Yahweh. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith Yahweh, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it on their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. Continuing in the text of John chapter 1, verses 22 through 25. Then they said unto him, Who art thou, that we may give an answer to them that sent us? What sayest thou of thyself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. And they, which were sent of the Pharisees, and they asked him, and said unto him, Why baptizest thou then, if thou be not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor that prophet? So, of course, they know the vo verse that he's quoting from Isaiah, chapter 40, verse 3. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of Yahweh, make straight in the desert. A highway for our God. So John did not invent baptism. He is using a traditional ritual, the ritual which is of mikveh. The question is, is he making a new application of this ritual of mikveh? Now this is a very old problem going back to the first century. As written in Tractate Shabbat 130, Rabbi Shimon Bel Elazar, who was active from about 170 to 200 AD, declares, This is how it will be in the days of Messiah. There will be no thou shalt and no thou shalt not commandments. Not everyone is in agreement, but even at that time, there was a discussion about whether when the Messiah came, he would change the law or not. So this is not something that popped up that we have recently discovered that's been going on in the church aforetime or lately, but it is a very old discussion. To the minds of the delegation that was sent to see what John was doing, they expect that mikveh will be used as a ritual purification method before any slaughter of animals can be done. It's a de declaration to be ritually pure uh, after leprosy, sexual uncleanness, the many circumstances which you can read about. So this is their mindset. John is using the ritual actually for the same purpose, but they cannot make the transition in the thought because these people are not wanting to go up to the temple, but they are going to be initiated into a ritual purity as a result of Yeshua's death and his taking 
all the sins of the world uh, on himself during the crucifixion at that time. So it is not really a new application, but the delegation who is sent to talk to him, they cannot understand it. Continuing with the text, verses 26 to 28, John answered them saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom ye know not. He it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latch it I am not worthy to unloose. These things were done in Bethabara, beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. So we know that untying the shoes is a job which is given to a slave. And John is saying, I'm even too low. And this man that is coming, this Messiah, is so high that I am too low in stature to even be his slave. Verse 29, the next day John seeth Yeshua coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Again, we have an echo from Genesis 22. Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So this is the first place where we have the concept of the Lamb of God being given as an offering. What lambs of offering will come to their mind? Exodus 12.21, Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your fat families and kill the Passover. And later we see when Paul talks about the Lamb of God, he is referring to Yeshua being the Passover lamb. The other lambs they might be thinking of in Exodus 29, 38. Now this is that which thou shalt offer upon the altar, two lambs of the first year day by day continually. So this is the daily sacrifice. There are two lambs every day. Continuing in the text, verses 30 through 34. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me, and I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore I come baptizing with water. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him, and I knew him not. But when he that sent me to baptize with water... The same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Spirit. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. So John is saying, you know, I didn't know anything really about this, but God sent me on this mission to baptize in order that this man, Yeshua, would be made manifest. And I didn't even know who it was when he came, but when the dove lit on him, then I know. God gave me a sign that this was the one. Now, in general, the dove is considered to be a symbol for Israel, but we do have this. Of course, the people are familiar with the dove from the story of Noah, but there is also a commentary in Hagiga 15a. Whence and whither Ben Zoma, one of the sages, he replied, I was gazing between the upper and the lower waters, and there is only a bare three fingers breadth between them. For it is said, he comes to this conclusion as a result of Genesis 1, and the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters, and he makes the parallel like a dove which hovers over her young without touching them. Benzoma makes the parallel between the Spirit of God and the dove hovering. As far, again, as the idea of him being before the foundation and also of him being a son of God, we see these scriptures. Isaiah 9, 6 and 7, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Pele, Yoetz, El Gibor, Aviad, Sar Shalom. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David, and upon his kingdom to order it, and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of Yahweh of hosts will perform this. Again in Micah 5, 2. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall be come forth unto me, that is, to be the ruler of Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. In Psalm 2, 7, I will declare the decree Yahweh has said to me, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. Striking verse from Proverbs, verse 30. Who hath ascended up into heaven, or descended, 
who hath gathered the wind in his fists, who hath bound the waters in a garment, who hath established all the ends of the earth. This is obviously speaking of Yehovah. What is his name and what is his son's name, if you can? In Daniel 7.13, I saw in the night's visions and beheld, one like a son of man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him. Continuing in the text, verses 35 through 38. And again the next day after John stood and two of his disciples and looking upon Yeshua as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Yeshua. Then Yeshua turned and saw them following, and saith unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? The word there, which is translated master, is not a good translation. The word in Greek is evaskale, and it means teacher, which is a better interpretation. So, for one thing, we see throughout the book there are some Hebrew words which are transliterated into Greek, and then a definition is given. And so, again, we see that this is meant to be read by both Jews and Greeks, that Messiah is a Messiah for the whole world. Now, we're going to see from the timing that perhaps they were asking more than just where did he live, but they were asking where he was going to spend the Shabbat day. In uh, verses 39 through 42, And he saith unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt, and abode with him for that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah which is being interpreted the Christ. Again, you have that transliteration and translation. And he brought him to Yeshua. And when Yeshua beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Kepha, which by interpretation is a stone, Petros. In Greek, the word for stone is Petros, and we see that's his name, Peter. So he replies to them, Come and see. There are hundreds of examples in rabbinic and Talmudic literature where the rabbi says, come and see, as he's about to explain something. It's very, very rabbinical language. The fact that it was the 10th hour is 4 o'clock in the afternoon, so it seems like they found him late in the day and probably stayed with him overnight and stayed with him the next day, which might have meant that it, that it was Shabbat. So whether Simon Peter's father's name was really Jonah or whether Yeshua was just trying to tie the two together by calling him that, or it was a happy circumstance, I don't know. But Peter and Jonah are tied together. First of all, both of them left from Yafo. Second of all, they were sent to the nations, and they both learned the lesson that the people, all people groups, are loved by Yahweh. Uh, Peter had that, that vision about the food, and he wasn't going to eat the food. And people who say that's what that vision means have not read the end of the chapter, where Peter tells you his interpretation of the vision. And he says that I see that I should call no man unclean. Of course, Jonah in no way wanted to preach to those uh, heathen in Nineveh, but he found that God cared for them. And then we have the parallel stories of the storm at sea. Of course, the rock has great significance to the people because that rock is God. Exodus 17:6. Behold, I stand before thee there upon the rock at Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And later, Moses explains in Deuteronomy 32, 4, He is the rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. Again, in Deuteronomy 32, 30, Moses refers to Yahweh, Yehovah, as the rock. How should one chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight, except their rock had sold them, and Yahweh had shut them up. Next time we'll continue. In the meantime, Tasimita Inayim, Al Hashemayim, keep your eye on the sky, your redemption draweth nigh. Shalom.